These are the spiders in your fortress. Hello YouTube, and welcome back to the channel. This one's a little different. My last video covering the hobo spider, giant house spider, and barn funnel weaver was a two-parter and a bit of a marathon, and it was a ton of research work on my end. So this one is a bit of a breather, but also one that's kind of exciting to me, as this is about a spider that was totally new to me, and that I came across unexpectedly in a very unique place. And I wanted to do a video that just sort of documented that story, because it was a really cool day for me. You're probably not going to find this spider in your house. I found it in the tunnels dug beneath a fortress built over 250 years ago on a tiny island in Halifax Harbour. So today you'll find out about the island, its place in both Canadian and American history, the story of how I found the spider, how it probably got there, and what we know about it. Which, incidentally, is surprisingly little, and that's part of what makes this spider intriguing to me. Now a quick thank you to Catherine Scott and Sean McCann, who helped me out with some of the research and contributed some photographs for this video. Thank you, it helped out a lot. And of course, a huge thank you to my wife, who not only gives me a lot of feedback as I draft these videos, but who is largely responsible for even finding this spider in the first place. So thank you, honey. And also to my kids, who actually helped me out in the field holding lights and camera stuff. So thanks, kids. Now, back in August, we hopped over to Halifax to do a tour of George's Island. Located in Halifax Harbour, Nova Scotia, it was recognized as a National Historic Site in 1965. Back in the mid-1700s, Halifax was a fledgling British settlement at a time when Nova Scotia was contested territory between the British, the French, the Acadians, and the Mi'kmaq. The island was situated perfectly as a defense point of the harbour, so in 1750, shortly after the outbreak of a war between the British and an alliance of the Acadians and Mi'kmaq, known as Father Le Loutre's War, the British started building Fort Charlotte, a fortified military emplacement armed with massive cannons and staffed by many soldiers. It's got some ugly history. In the mid-1700s, the British expelled over 11,000 Acadians from their homes and the lands they had farmed for over a century in Nova Scotia, deporting them to other British colonies. It's estimated that about 5,000 of those died from disease, shipwrecks, or starvation in the process. Now, many of them eventually ended up in what was then called Spanish Louisiana, and is now just Louisiana, and the word Acadian slowly transformed. Acadian? Acadian? Cajun. That's where that word comes from, and this series of events forged the link between Atlantic Canada and Louisiana and states around it. Anyway, during this time, nearly 1,700 Acadians were imprisoned at Fort Charlotte on George's Island before being sent elsewhere. So it wasn't a great time. During the American Revolution, British troops were stationed on the island to protect Halifax Harbour from American privateers and the famous American privateer Captain David Ropes was actually imprisoned there for a time. Fort Charlotte remained an operational military fortress from the time of Father Le Loutre's war and the expulsion of the Acadians in the 1750s, through the American Revolution, the American Civil War, and all the way through both world wars before finally being declared a National Historic Site in 1965. However, it was almost entirely closed to the public until just three years ago, and I don't think the people who lived and worked there for all those years made spider identification much of a priority. So, on a nice sunny day, the family and I caught a ferry out to the island. On the top side, we saw a lot of the old buildings and fortifications, like these massive cannons, and of course, some of the usual spiders you would expect to see in an environment like that, like this zebra jumper, but the cool stuff was underground. There's a whole maze of tunnels dug in under the fortress that were used to move things around, like cannon shot and powder. Some of the cannons were actually mounted underground as well, like this absolute unit right here. And in one of the tunnels, ironically, it was my wife who pointed out a spider on the wall. Now, when I first looked at it, I didn't recognize it. At first glance, I thought it was some kind of theridiate, like a false widow of some kind. But this was a surprise. Look closely at this photo right here. What do you see? This spider was an orb weaver. 
which is not what I would have expected down here in an underground environment. Now, in a baffling stroke of serendipity, my family were literally the only people in the tour group for that time slot, so we asked the guide if we could stop for a few minutes and take some photos. He did a pretty good job of masking his confusion, as never before had he given a tour to the kind of weirdos who wanted to stop and take pictures of the spiders in his very impressive historical fortress. But he happily agreed, as he had never given the spiders much thought before, and now he was sort of curious too. So out came the Pentax and the Flash and the Umbrella. Now, I wish I had taken more photos, and I really only got these two good ones, but they were what I had time for before we had to carry on with the tour. And as much as I would have liked to, I opted not to capture one from a National Historic site. I figured the photos would be enough for IDing the spider, and once I got home and went flipping through Sarah Rose's book, I was able to ID this spider as Meta Ovalis, the Eastern Cave Longjawed Orb Weaver. Now when we think of orb weavers, spiders that make circular patterned webs that look like this, what we're usually thinking about is the family Araneidae, which includes spiders like Araneus diadematus, the cross orb weaver, or the Lurineoides genus. These ones belong to the family Tetranathidae. Now most Tetranathids live above ground, often over water, and make horizontal orb webs. But the Meta genus thinks different. These are cave-dwelling spiders, and they will make their orb webs in any orientation the space allows, sometimes horizontal, sometimes vertical, sometimes in between. In Europe, Metaminardi is probably the most common spider from this genus, and the genus contains about 34 different species. But here in North America, only two of them occur. Meta ovalis occurs in the east, south to about Alabama, north to about Quebec City, west to about Arkansas and Thunder Bay, and all the way east to the coast. The other one, Meta Doloff, occurs only in California around the Monterey Bay. Now we don't know much about these spiders, probably because spiders tend not to get studied unless they're important in pest control, have effects on pollinators, or are medically significant. And this one is none of those things. So when I went searching for papers, there was practically nothing. And that only made me more fascinated by this spider. When I come across a spider that seems really unique but has next to nothing written about it, I wonder what other secrets it might have. This thesis by Megan Rector, which was pretty neat, seemed to be one of the only major works on the species out there. Now, Rector studied the distribution of the spiders throughout the cave systems, as well as differences in how the webs were constructed. Caves can be divided into three distinct light zones. The entrance, where direct light from outside the cave can be seen, the twilight zone, where no direct light, but only reflected light from the outside can be seen, and the dark zone, where no light at all can be detected by the human eye. Meta ovalis was found in all three zones, but back in the dark zone, mostly adult spiders were found, while immature or subadult spiders generally stayed in the entrance and twilight zones. Now these do show up in various cave-like places, old mine shafts, hollow logs, occasionally basements, Sean McCann found this one in an outhouse here in Nova Scotia, having built its orb web right across the main hole. But they generally look for dark, cave-like places. Now one might wonder, if these are cave spiders, how did they get to George's Island when it was isolated for so long? The best answer for this seems to come from Peter Smithers' 2005 study on Meta Minardi, which is basically a European version of Meta ovalis. These spiders have a really unique life cycle that Smithers was able to observe. The spiderlings hatch out of their eggs, molt once in the egg sac, then emerge, assembling in sibling groups on the cave ceiling for a while. Then, usually in the spring, they seem to become attracted to light and actually leave the cave, making little horizontal orb webs in the vegetation outside. They stay outside for six to eight weeks, during which time many of them balloon away. Now, this ballooning is pretty amazing. It turns out that spiders can actually sense the electric fields in the air, and when those fields are strong enough, the spiders let out a line of silk. The electric fields are enough to actually lift the spider off the ground, at which point air currents will carry them anywhere from a few meters to hundreds of kilometers.
After this six to eight week period though, something changes in them, and they start wanting to avoid light. And this is when they seek out new caves or cave-like environments. Now there's some speculation that they're able to sense air currents blowing from cave entrances, allowing them to locate these new environments. Now this study was done on Meta Minardi, but given all of the other similarities, it's reasonable to believe that Meta Ovalis does the same thing, though I couldn't find any actual reports of anyone seeing it happening, probably just due to the lack of actual study on the species in North America. But they're so close to the same spider that until we have evidence to the contrary, this is the best conclusion. It's probably less wronger than any other conclusion. And you know how I feel about that. Anyway, given that George's Island is less than 400 meters from the mainland, that's about 440 yards in freedom units, they almost definitely got there by ballooning, as that kind of distance to a ballooning spider is like you or I stepping over the ramen bowl my teenager left on the living room floor. No problem at all. But once they got there, how did they thrive there? How does an orb weaver catch prey when it lives underground, where there tend to not be many flying insects to get caught in a web? Now I mentioned earlier that some of these spiders could be found all the way into the dark zones of caves. And you might think, as orb weavers, how many insects are flying around in the near total darkness of the back of a cave that would get caught in an orb web? Well, these spiders actually employ multiple hunting strategies, unlike most orb weavers. They do the sit and wait thing, sitting in the middle of the orb web or at the edge, like we're used to seeing with more familiar orb weavers. But as adults, they seem to employ a couple of other methods as well. Adults will come off the web and actually forage on the cave walls, stalking prey like a wolf spider might. So they'll hunt terrestrial invertebrates like millipedes and crickets, as well as flying ones. They've also been observed swinging out on a silk drag line and capturing aerial prey in the air. But this seems to be unique to adults. Adults also build their webs a little differently than juveniles do. When Megan Rector did her thesis on these spiders, she also took a close look at the structure of the webs. Subadults were found to have a tighter, denser capture spiral to their webs, which would maximize chances of catching the small flying prey that would be present in the entrance and twilight zones of caves. While adult webs were more sparse, requiring less energy and nutrients to build, so the adults invest less in their orb webs, the odds of catching flying prey are slimmer as it is, and their other hunting methods, like actively foraging on the cave walls, may be a more efficient use of their energy. Now this change in hunting behavior might be a tetranathid thing, as another spider in this family, Pachynatha, is an orb weaver when immature, but when it reaches adulthood, it loses the ability to make orb webs altogether and becomes an active ground hunter. We don't know a whole lot more than this about this spider. After reading what I could find on this species, and even this whole genus, I was left wondering, why do they live in caves? They don't seem to have any obvious adaptations that would make them specifically suited for it, so this seems to be a question that we just don't have the answer to yet. And that makes these spiders especially fascinating to me. They're secretive, living most of their lives underground, they defy the conventions of their family, with their choice of habitat, for reasons we don't yet understand, and that has brought them here, to the subterranean environment of this 250-year-old part of Canadian history. They're a spider that can go easily unnoticed or unappreciated despite their unique life cycle. A part of, as Spencer Hoffman would put it, a secret world going on all around us, sometimes in the last places we expect. If you ever find yourself in Halifax and have the chance to check out George's Island, it's well worth the time. Some say it's even cooler than the Citadel. Do the tunnel tour and watch the walls. Pay attention and you'll find this spider waiting for you, because they're there, and probably have been for a very long time, just making their way in the world as best as they know how. So that's it for this short one. Have you folks ever come across this spider, or other spiders that seem to have very specialized habitats? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that little bell so you get notified when I upload a new video. 
And thanks so much to my patrons. And if you like getting extra spider content like research stories and behind the scenes stuff, check out my Patreon page. It's a great way to support the channel so I can keep making these videos. And you get the inside scoop on what's going on before finished videos actually hit YouTube and some of the stuff that doesn't make it in. And if you're looking for one of these for yourself or one of your friends, maybe you got a buddy who works at NASA who could use one, check out my Shopify store here and link below. But for now, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've learned something about this spider in your fortress, and I hope to see you next time. Cheers! A fortified millimeter. <sighs> During the American Revolution, British troops were stationed on the. <sighs>